sorry. Can you ask? Can we? Can can you sit down? Can you ask Prof to come? Uh, this lecture has not ended. Please. We try to as accommodate as possible, but we can't take everybody. Can you allow Prof to respond? We will see. Sitala Gutulwe, can we listen to Prof? Onyame Yogi Ndoya Ke Weza Guti Namthanje at Kenya and other activities and also in the world. Can we listen to him as he's responding to this question that I've asked? Thank you very much. First, let me uh, respond with a caveat that the answers I give do not necessarily represent the truth. They represent my views. And my views may be honest but mistaken. So it is in that vein that my answers must be understood. Let me start with the very first question about the next generation. It is true that there are many heroes, and there are many heroes in, in South Africa. Some alive, some long departed, and we can count them. But a country makes a choice, and this is a choice that must be made by the country, depending on its history and its circumstances. To immortalize some, or to immortalize one as a symbol of unity. If you go to Ghana, they have the six of their leading freedom fighters on the banknotes. You go to Nigeria, they have chosen to give certain denomination to Namdi Azikiwe, some to Muritala Mohammed. You go to the United States of America, there are some George Washington, Sam Abraham Lincoln, and recently I think they had made a decision that a certain black lady will have a portrait on the currency. India chose Mahatma Gandhi. My answer is the South Africans, informed by their sense of history, acutely aware that there were other heroes, isolated one from their ranks and said, this is our symbol of unity. If 200 years from today, another generation were to take a different view, that generation will be informed by history and its own circumstances. <laughs> the second question is learn. Land is indeed the last colonial question. The truth is that whether it was the French or the British, all the colonizers, the first factor of production, you remember that the major factor of production during the agrarian revolution was land. And therefore what you took was land. They came to our societies. We had our own unique methods of dealing with land. Land belonged to nobody. It is the proceeds or the profit of the land that belong to the person who worked the land. In fact, there is a story in Kenya amongst a people called the Jibana, who when the British came and they said that the land belonged to the queen, he said, how can land possibly belong to the queen? Land belongs to God. And one of the British people sarcastically said, yes, we know land belongs to God, but the queen will hold it on behalf of God <laughs> and distribute it to you in form of leases. And, and, and therefore, the radical title remains with the queen. And that is what they did, the best of land everywhere in Africa, whether it was in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, much more perniciously, Zimbabwe much more perniciously, Mozambique, Angola, everywhere. And indeed, I dare say, the struggle for land was the struggle to regain, the struggle for independence was to regain the land. That it was never anything, it's freedom and land. Because land is what defines you. 
Kenya's Ali Mazurui, in one of the most celebrated documentaries, Africa Triple Heritage, says it is the peace of earth from which you come and into which you will go that defines you. And that anybody who takes that land undermines your very humanity. That is, that is how land, that is how important land is. The history of South Africa is well documented and well written. I don't think that there is anybody in South Africa or in Zimbabwe or in Namibia that disagrees with the fact that land was improperly expropriated. That is a given. In Kenya, what the British did, and I think this is the model that they tried in Zimbabwe, that the British government itself, in an acknowledgement of the reality, actually did provide money for Africans to buy land from the white farmers. But remember that the history of Kenya was very different from the history of South Africa. In fact, that model was to be applied in Zimbabwe, but they never went through it. The reality, therefore, is how do you deal, and I think, and this is an area where I must read very cautiously, very cautiously, because you have in South Africa a white population that holds the view that this is their land, that they have nowhere else to go. That is the difficulty of the situation in South Africa. But they must also know that it is untenable for a small population to hold over 60% of the land. You can only postpone the problem. In other words, if I were a white person and an owner of land, I would be the very first to organize my people and to create an environment where we negotiate land out of our hands in a programmatic manner. Why do I say so? Because if it is, if, if it is not programmatic, it is likely, and I'm not saying this is what will happen, if you look at the history of Algeria, when the Algerians could, or the, when the French could not retain what they want, they went on a destruction spree. If we cannot have it, nobody will have it. Do I have a solution? My solution is that the South Africans have a solution. Why do I think so? I've been watching very keenly successive leaders. It's, it's a hot potato. It is a hot potato, and I've listened very keenly in the recent uh, past to President Cyril Ramaphosa. He is talking to chiefs because they also have interest in land. He's talking to the white farmers. But I think ultimately there will be a sit down. And at that sit, sit down, and this is my prescription, those who hold land must be told if they are not aware. That if you continue to have this land without accommodating the majority, it is untenable. And let me give you a small story that I keep on telling in different fora. If you organize a dance and you have a music set that is producing the music, and you don't allow people who want to be in the dance. They have a very small choice. They destroy the equipment and there is no dance. <laughs> the wisdom of the occasion demands that you accommodate them and make them part of the dance. How do you do it? That must depend on the unique circumstances of each country with the political and collective wisdom of that country and it would be arrogant and irresponsible for somebody who has flown from Kenya to purport to prescribe how it should be done. The person from Kenya can only say one thing, that it is completely untenable for a minority to hold the bulk of the land and the sooner they realize it and the sooner they begin releasing a critical mass of it, the safer they themselves are. <laughs> Let me advert to the question of ethnicity. I was listening to an Asian politician citing something that he got from Greek mythology 
And it says very simple that in Greek mythology, citizens were divided into three. You must have listened to this or read about it. That they are idiots. Idiots. One, the first category of individuals in any society are idiots. These idiots is not because they are mentally challenged. They are idiots because they live, they think they live in an island that they don't care about anybody. There are these individuals when there is anti-social activity, they build walls around them, then they have CCTVs, then they have panic buttons, then they have German shepherds, and they think they are safe. Those are idiots. <laughs> they are idiots because they don't know that they are in the minority and if there is a social breakdown, the thing that they are protecting the panic button that they think they will press when they are panicked, they'll be so panicked that they'll never remember where the buttons are. <laughs> that those are idiots. And then they are tribalists. Tribalists are not people who belong to a particular tribe. But they are individuals who out of their naivete or stupidity or arrogance hold the view that they belong to a club and that that club invariably they are the ones who appeal to the very base emotions of people from their tribe. They are the individuals who once they have stolen, then they say, they tell the tribe we are being finished, I know them, they exist in Kenya. And the people who have not been educated sometimes adopt them. They say, we know he is a thief, but he is our thief. He's ours. <laughs> Those are tribalists. What they don't know, the danger of such individuals is that when they are stealing, they are stealing on their own behalf. And the only thing that you have is a feel-good effect. Then there is the final category according to the Greeks. These are called the citizens. The citizens know they live in a society. They know that their general and overall well-being not only requires but demands that they cede certain of their rights because they live in a society. When they drive and they are going to work, they know that the only reason why they are comfortable when they are on their lane is because they know the other person will keep their lane. They know that when they are entering a lift, somebody will obey the rule. Those are the citizens. The tragedy of Africa is that in many societies, we have been rendered idiots and tribalists. We have been rendered. And Nyerere used to say it very well, that people who are politically and intellectually bankrupt normally seek refuge in ethnicity and religion as the major factor of mobilization. And, 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 I think, and I think that those politically bankrupt individuals are very easy to identify. And because we are speaking on the occasion of the memory of Madiba, one of the things that in my view he succeeded in doing is to liberate himself from the strictures of idiocy and tribalism. And he became a citizen, not only of South Africa, but of Africa and the world. And if therefore we are to sustain these societies, and I've said it in my paper, Ali Mazrui has written a book called The Power of Babel, which is a contradiction of what is called the Tower of Babel in the Bible. And he says that if only we could emulate the piano, that the piano has a black and a white key, it depends on how you play it. If you give it to somebody like myself who has no sense of music, it is the cacophony of the noise that will irritate you. But you give it to Sahara here, she'll twang the keys and create symphony. So too it is argued that we can use our strengths and in every society, in our unguarded moments, we are able to say, these vendors, they are good for something. These pondos, they are unique in something. These Zulus, they are unique in something. These Kosas, they are unique in something. These Sotos, they are unique in something. These Tuanas, they are unique in something. If we could combine all those, then in my view, that is a perfect recipe for success. And, and, and in my view, 
I think that is the function of leadership. And, and let us, the, one of the things that we must guard against when we are talking about leadership, in Africa, as in many parts of the world, particularly in Africa, we have individuals who occupy positions of leadership. They are not leaders. They just occupy those positions. So that must not be confused. And we, partly, as the electorate, we are responsible. Because sometimes when the electorate is given a choice between a good man and a good woman, the African electorate has a very unique inclination towards bad people. Yes. Particularly those who bribe them and those who appeal to their ethnic emotions. But let me tell you that we have countries that we can learn from. I was reading the history of Switzerland. Switzerland was at war for very many years. Then one leader came and said, why? Let us organize ourselves into cantons, those who are Italian speaking, those who are German speaking, those who are Flemish speaking, those who are French speaking. Let us create the cantons and have a center that is only the coordinator of foreign affairs and defense. And each one of us realizes their potential. And I hold the view that a country such as South Africa, South Africa has the second largest economy in this continent. And on, in truth, South Africa's economy is the largest in Africa, not Nigeria. If you look at relative to population and other things, it has the largest economy. This economy is capable of being a $1 trillion GDP economy in the next five years. But it all depends on leadership. And leadership is also determined by the quality of followership. And that is why I think that having party cadres is a very important thing. Having an institute, there are very few political parties in Africa today. And if you permit me to count, I know that South Africa has a number of political parties, but I'll only choose one, which I think has distinguished itself as a political party. It's internal problems notwithstanding. African National Congress is a political party. Why do I say so? Since 1912, it has gone through tribals and tribulations and it has institutions which are larger than the individuals. There have been individuals who have tried to make themselves larger than the party, but the party has reminded rather rudely that you are smaller than you think you are. That is a political party. The other political party in Africa is Swapo in, in Namibia. That is a political party. It can call leaders to order. Another political party is Frelimo. It can call people to order. Another political party is MPLA in Angola. The other political party is CCM in Tanzania. In my country, Kenya, you don't have political party. <laughs> You have political outfits which we use to go to elections every five years. <laughs> but we are slowly beginning to recognize, I say this because Kenya also has the problem of, of ethnicity. But yet, as I conclude that limb of my answer, Tanzania. Tanzania has 136 ethnic groups, or thereabouts. And through the initiative of one individual with the assistance of his comrades in arm, for a long time Tanzania, and largely even now, the Tanzanians will elect their president and they don't care his ethnic extraction. They may have their problems as indeed any society has. There may be within their ranks bankrupt politicians who are now beginning or trying to appeal to ethnicity and religion, but they are sooner smothered, which convinces me, therefore, that a country such as South Africa, with the legacy of such great men and women that you have had, you can deal with the problem of ethnicity so that, in truth, you cease to look at the weaknesses of communities and harness their strengths and in that way, use them to good effect. The task is ours, yours and the political leadership. If we leave it to political leaders, as my good friend told me, there are many dealers masquerading as leaders. <laughs> the third question is the one which you asked is political reality, which is also related to land, I think. 
and the one that was asked about solutions. You know, sometimes when I think about Africa, and I think about Africa keenly on, on a daily basis, particularly now that I travel across Africa, I go through many immigration points, and sometimes I see a white man with an American passport, with a Canadian passport, receiving smiles from the immigration officials. But when they see a fellow African, they change. Why have you come here? How many days? Which hotel? I told somebody in Namibia, that whenever you see an African has taken a plane and arrived here, nine out of ten times such Africans are not refugees. Nine out of ten times, because traveling within Africa is very expensive. My point here is, and I conclude it with a story, so that you get my point, the young lady who asked the question. The story is one that I've told and I keep on changing it without losing its true trust. It's a story that was told by a famous African called James M. Kwejiragri. James M. Kwejiragri was a great Ghanaian, the first Ghanaian to hold a PhD, the first Ghanaian to be the deputy principal of their leading school at that time, Achimota College. He was referred to as Agri of Africa. He was a believer in Africa. And I've looked at that story, and there is yet another story that I'll refer you to, is a speech that was given by your own fellow South African in 1906 at the University of Columbia, the Renaissance Regeneration of Africa, the speech of Pixley Kaisaka Seme. And James M. Kwejiragri gives the story and says, that there was a poultry farmer. And this poultry farmer, as one must when you are a poultry farmer, kept chicken. But one day the chicken strayed and they came back with them a chick that looked very different. After some time, it looked different. And a naturalist came to his farm and said, but this chick is not a chicken. And the farmer said, I know it is not a chicken, but we have fed it on chicken feed for rather long and it has lost its his, his eaglehood is now a chicken. It has acquired chickenhood. <laughs> and the naturalist said, no, even if you are an eagle, no matter how long you are fed on chicken feed, you never lose your eaglehood. You remain an eagle. And he said, let me demonstrate. And on the first day, he tried to demonstrate by allowing the chicken to, the chick to fly and it refused. And the farmer said, I told you, it was once an eagle. We have fed it on chicken feed. It has lost its eaglehood. It is now a chicken. He came the following day and said, very early in the morning, and put it on the palm of its hand, and it flew and flew away, and the naturalist said, I told you, once you are an eagle, no matter how long you are fed on chicken feed, you never lose your eaglehood. And James Kwejira Agri then said, that we Africans have been fed on chicken feed for a very long time. And sometimes we believe that we cannot achieve what is within our reach. And he reminded his audience that we are eagles. The things we think we cannot achieve, we can achieve. And it has been demonstrated. Look at Rwanda after the genocide in 1994. Its obituary was written. If you listen to CNN, if you listen to Al Jazeera, if you listen to BBC, if you listen to them, all of them were saying, we told you. They cannot run their affairs. They never remind you that they themselves were involved in tribal wars in 1914 and 1945. When the European tribes are fighting, they call them world wars. That is what they do. So they confuse us. But it's just European tribes. <laughs> just look at the wars. Then they f bring a few. Then they call it world. Which world? It's tribal wars in Europe. <laughs> but then what happened is that within my lifetime, 
the Rwandese may have their problems as any society have, but they have demonstrated that they can solve their problem, which was founded on ethnicity. We, I am of the considered view that solutions lie within us. And that is why the shortest avenue to solution of societal problems is to have good leadership. But I don't believe in messianic leadership. If you create messiahs, then they begin to think they are gods. And immediately they become gods. They cannot be questioned. And when they become, when you cannot question them, then they begin to mess you up. There must be a team of leaders who represent a particular vision. And that is why institutions are at the very heart of it. If no matter how good you are, we must have a system that calls you to order. And if we do that, then we will have solutions within us. The lady said, and this is what I conclude with, I used to think when I was a little younger that all things should be solved during my lifetime. I'm now more realistic. If they are solved within my lifetime, hallelujah. If they are not solved within my lifetime, my joy is that I have made a contribution. And Ali Mazurui was a Kenyan political scientist. And in the 1970s, when apartheid was at its very height, he was interviewed and he was asked, in your contribution in the fight against apartheid, what is your contribution? He said, I don't buy apples from South Africa. But I do not believe that my refusal to buy apples from South Africa will bring the apartheid regime down. But if there are one million of us who don't buy apples, then apartheid will calm down because it's the droplets that make the ocean. And I think that there is wisdom in that. So lower your expectations. There are certain things that will happen in your lifetime there are certain things that will not happen in your lifetime. I think I've answered the questions. Thank you very much.